welcome back to the Reptiles and Research podcast. I'm your host, Liam Sinclair, and in today's episode, we have Dave Lorks. Now, Dave is very well known in the UK. He used to be quite a big character across the south of the UK, working in many different shops, working in some zoos down here, before moving to New Zealand to go work at Auckland Zoo with all their native species and with some exotic species as well as a leadership role with the reptile team so dave has got a breadth of experience this was a fantastic conversation we go into the nitty-gritty of like what it's like to work with tuatara how he felt with his collection and working with reptiles professionally and the, the struggles he went through some of his learning experiences across his career and how he developed as a keeper and some key moments throughout working in shops and zoos there were turning points for his development as a keeper and also we go into positive lists and welfare of that kind and that nature. And Dave has some pro positive list opinions that some of you may not agree with. But also I feel like it's very important that you listen to someone else's point of view to really understand the pros and cons of the whole scenario. I don't think we should be blind, rabid dogs barking at the mailman or any any threat each time. I think it should be well articulated, understood rebuttal of something if that's the way you are so inclined but you must understand the pros and cons so i enjoyed this i'm not like gritted to the teeth screaming about positive lists i like to have a very balanced conversation and i can kind of see dave's point of view as well so it's a really great conversation so i love this chat before we get into it thank you so much to custom reptile habitats for sponsoring the channel they're keeping us going they're helping us a significant amount of running this show and this channel if you want some premium pvc enclosures head on over to the link in the description to custom reptile habitats for some great enclosures if you're seeking a sense of community with other watchers of this channel who are passionate about science and reptiles then why not join our discord there'll be a link in the description where you'll get access to joining our discord group where all of us chat and get to know each other and chat about reptiles and normally they're taking a piss out of me, but there you go. Go ahead and join from the link below. If you really want to help support and be a part of this mission, then please head on over to Patreon slash Reptiles and Research, where you can join and take part in the mission that we're trying to pursue here. And with all of that, let's bring on Dave Locks. So thank you so much for coming on, Dave. I know, obviously, I know you personally, but... Could you just introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners? Yeah, of course. Um, my name's Dave Lorks. I'm a British herpetologist living in New Zealand, and I'm currently the team leader of Active Firms at Auckland Zoo. So you've obviously gone from being a a private keeper to going to so all this sort of this journey up into working into zoological collections. But at the very beginning, what was your introduction to keeping? So um, my, my my dad's a lepidopterist, um, well, an amateur lepidopterist. He's always had a, a avid avid interest in moths and butterflies. And as long as I can remember, I, you know, I, we we ran a moth trap and we submitted to the national moth record, and that was that was kind of very very um, that was a very normal part of my childhood. Um, and my dad used to attend the um, amateur entomological society meetings up at Kempton Park. And um, he'd go talk to the, you know, native native moth people. And um, from a very, very young age, I was fascinated with the exotic invertebrates, you know, tarantula scorpions, um, you know, in particular, really, really caught my eye. And quite, a, quite from a quite, quite a young age, I was keeping um, giant African land snails, uh, African giant millipedes. And then I got my first tarantula when I was eight, eight years old. Um, and it sort of snowballed from there. And I started keeping reptiles at 10. I got my first ball python and I got a Brazilian rainbow bar for, um, for my 11th birthday. And, um, that was, that was it. I was sort of hooked. And, you know, by the time I was a very young teenager, my, my, my bedroom looked more like a reptile shop than a bedroom. Yeah. I know what that feels like. <laughs> like yeah. Much like, much, much like the room you're currently sat in. Yeah, I can imagine. Maybe not the same temperature, or maybe it is. At the moment, it's 29 degrees in here, so it is spicy at the moment. So back then, then, obviously, your dad was doing all of that. I'd imagine it didn't take much to convince him to let you have, like, tarantulas and stuff. No, so <clears throat> I um, 
I think he always had also a bit a bit of background interest and a bit of fascination. So um, you know, him and him and him and myself up in London for the day, you know, my mum and sister know her in sight. Dad can have a tarantula. Yeah, okay. And um and yeah, it was uh it was it, it, I never had to fight too hard to um, you know, have the have the freedom to sort of keep these things at home. And I I know one of the things I think a lot of people come up against, you know, particularly in their early years with this interest, is just get over the line with you know their parents to allow them to you know keep these animals i was i was really i was really fortunate my parents were always very open-minded and supportive and you know fed my passion and interest rather than try to stifle it yeah 100 percent know that it, that is like i think a lot of us had to fight like tooth and tooth and claw to get that first one into it and once you've uh once you've got through the door i think it kind of snowballs from there so yeah for sure this is one of the questions that that I prepared that you said made you feel old, but let me ask it in a different way. So you've been in keeping far longer than, than me. So in your opinion, what would you say has changed in those years? So I think, I think, I think the obvious thing is technology, you know, technology's changed when, um, when I, when I was first keeping, uh, specialist reptile shops were few and far between, um they were predominantly stocking lamps that they were buying from b and q or home base um and selling them as reptile lights and uh, and it really really was a case of trying to make things work um you know you know best best we could um you know the, the lighting technology we had was poor the heating technology we had was between totally inadequate and almost adequate and in the last 20, 25 years, that's, you know, probably 30 years, you know, even pre my time, it's come along in leaps and bounds. And, you know, you know, the, the, um, technology we have available to us on our fingertips now is, is it's, it's, it's exponentially better. Um, and I, th I think that's, I think that's one of the really big things that's made, um, herpetoculture, not only more accessible, but, uh, more ethical and, and it's it's easy it's easier to get on board with keeping animals in captivity when you know you're keeping them properly, rather than you know buying something, accepting the fact it's going to slowly die for two years, then replacing it, which um which I think ha happened a lot in the eighties and nineties. So, back then, when you were first getting into it, did it feel? like at the time it was like oh it's not what i want it to be or at the time was it it was like this is really advanced because it is like the most advanced forms ever ever felt sort of thing did you ever imagine it being uh, where it is now um in my early early years i i didn't really have any thoughts or feelings i was very young i was 10 11 12 13 years old i was relying on the information provided to me by the people that I, I assumed at the time were in the know, and I was following their advice and keeping accordingly. Um, I now look back on it and, you know, it, it genuinely makes me cringe, you know, you know, keeping reptiles in fish tanks with modified tops and, you know, you know, it's hideous, hideous husbandry, but that was, that was what I had in, available to me. And, you know, even, even books from that period, you know, you know, talk, talk, you know, talk about these things like they're absolutely fine. Whereas obviously, you know, we, you know, we're so far past that now it's untrue. Um, it was only when I started getting more serious in my, I guess my mid to late teens, um, that I realized how lacking so much was, you know, I, I wanted to start providing proper nighttime lows, you know, thermal gradients, light gradients. Um, I wanted, I wanted to, you know, be able to strive to replicate what these animals would experience in the wild. And I realized how lacking the technology and equipment that was um, available to me was, and it, it just made all that sort of stuff really challenging. And you, you know, you find yourself with multiple lights, multiple heat sources, um, and you know, multiple thermostats. And for you know, and, and, re and realistically, it was it wasn't it wasn't practical. It, was, it wasn't it wasn't a practical setup. You know, you, you it, it was it was cluttered. It was busy, um, and it, it it just didn't do what we needed it to do. So seeing where we've got to now with with yeah better better technology you know particularly in thermostats and um t5 you know t5 units you know and and with um a better understanding of um of light um i i think it's far more achievable now and you know it's it, it's it's great it's great to see that that is where, where where we've got to and i'm really excited about the next 
10, 20 years. I just hope the hobby stays buoyant enough for these companies to continue investing in the technology. Because obviously, if, if the hobby goes away, then no one's going to invest in the technology and it's not going to develop. I think a lot of people that I've asked from a perspective that is before I could, could even experience that, uh, uh, it's always felt that way that the hobby might go under, the hobby might implode. Do you think it's a different landscape now, or do you think that we are not progressing fast enough? Um, it, it, to answer that question, I kind of need to separate it out. Mm -hmm. Technology, what's available to us, and what we can do is moving fast enough. The thing that is woefully lacking and you know frankly negligent is people's attitudes i don't know why in 2023 people are still keeping reptiles like they did in the 80s and the 90s and and it's accepted because it shouldn't be it's 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 appalling and we need to we need to you know i say as a hobby we need to get better or we need to accept the fact that we're gonna we're gonna you know come come under increasing scrutiny and ult and ultimately you know you know lose lose the things we love you know and that onus is on us you know that onus is, is on us as keepers you know we you know we need to be better and i don't i don't think a, a lot of people don't want to hear it and a lot of people don't want to do anything about it but you know i'm, I'm a firm believer in the most the, the most dangerous phrase in the english language is we've always done it this way you know, it's absolutely unexcusable. And, you know, we all have, we all have accountability. We, we all have to own this. Sorry, at some points I switch, I, sh I, I will shift from conversation to rant and I apologize. Nope, nope, that's perfect. There'll be little moments like that. And I'm like, that's a YouTube short clip. So that's perfect. Um, some of these attitudes, you referred to like the 80s and 90s and people with attitudes or keeping style might be the same. Is there anything in mind that you have when you think of that sort of, time period that people still do so particularly it's people's attitudes towards light you know people behave like these huge swathes of reptiles don't don't require uv it's like yeah all right you can keep without uv without killing it but it doesn't mean it's not better off with it and you know people using ceramic heaters to heat reptiles although we know that we know they can't utilize the heat that comes from them it's it's meaningless you know these these animals cannot utilize it you know, we, we, you know, we need to give them heat they can actually use. And people have got such a wild misunderstanding of, you know, I, I don't like the term heating and lighting because heat, heat is light. We just can't see it, you know, as, as you know, as, as you, know, we, 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 you know, most of us are aware. But we need to not separate those things out. We need to provide them with what they need and we need to use the equipment that gives them what they need we don't just go through and tick box oh ceramic heat ceramic heat to the same heart and they're done yes yeah, it's not it's not how it works it's not how husbandry works it's not how science works and um you know i i i, I went into I actually went into a reptile shop today and you know there's ceramic heaters for sale on 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 the on the shelves there's red bulbs for sale on on the shelves and i'm like what are they for <laughs> what are you hoping to achieve with these yeah, I mean, I went into a shop yesterday and I saw tortoises being kept with a ceramic and I'm just like, that hurts my soul. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Obviously, this perspective of how things have changed, my very first snake was obviously um, it was a deep heat projector, which I don't agree with myself now, but it was with T5 yep. UV, which is like, I'm from an, almost like a period now where... I can't have a I can appreciate what people tell me, but I can't remember it in a and felt like I experienced it in the same way that people were like, oh my god, UV is this new thing. Because to me, it's like old as old as stone always been there, sort of thing. Yeah. One of um one of the things that sort of I look back on it, it tickles me now is, you know, obviously a long time ago now when I was um keeping and breeding super dwarf reticulated pythons, um, I kept them all in vivariums, not racks and i gave them uv and i remember at the time thinking that i was bleeding edge i'm like i give snakes uv i am on the absolute knife absolute knife's edge of science and uh, you know and it was you know it was it wasn't bad from a welfare perspective and i was v very much one of the only people doing it to the point where i'd have a breeders going what are you doing that for and uh, uh, uh but you know it's 
it's it's funny how attitudes shift and you know as we as as we learn more you know we look back and go oh that wasn't flash or oh wouldn't want to do that now but you know it's all a learning curve you know it's um growth is important and reckon and recognizing that what who i am today isn't going to be as good as who i am next year and five years beyond 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 that that's important because you know the moment you stop growing the moment you think you know it all the moment you stop trying to actively learn and better yourself you know you've lost you know you're irrelevant you know you're you, yeah, you're literally irrelevant so I, th- I think you say that has been back then it was good for back then i think that's got an advanced attitude now even breeding snakes on any sort of like bigger scale than just like playing within your hobby and providing snakes with uv i think even now i think i'd be happy to see like commercial breeding of things even just including uv and things like that even on the small like yeah. um what's what's the term they use um micro breeder or something it's something like that small batch might be small batch micro batch something like that where it's just like a, it person's a bedroom breeding. Bedroom, breeder. A bedroom, <laughs> bedroom breeder in my day yeah 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 it's trying to be fancier now i suppose yeah micro build breeder small batch breeder craft breeder yeah yeah yeah, I think a lot of people providing like their breeders with UV would be a big step up even nowadays. So it's interesting how you thought that was like old. We 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 know we know full well that um you you know UV is directly related to the synthesis of vitamin D three um, for the processing of you know processing of calcium in reptiles, and you're breeding reptiles that are going under immense physiological st- stress, drawing calcium. Often from their bones, you're just going to support them, aren't you? You're going to you're going to you're going to create an environment to support that process, and um, yeah, it does it does. I mean, it's actually really disappointing to hear that that's not been more widely adopted. Like, I mean, I'm I'm pretty far removed from it these days. I've been um I've been out I've been out the British hobby for seven almost eight years. So it's um yeah, it's not it's not my world anymore. But you know, hopefully more people will you know do what they can to. You know, do right by these animals and you know su- support support their bod- bodily functions because the science tells us that's what they need yeah the science the science you know it's not it's not open to debate the science the science tells us what happens you know we we know we know what happens we know what the process is we 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 know what they need you know it's you know there's no there's no debate to be had it's just a case of whether or not you do it or not wait for 2023 let's go so you talk about being like further removed now um back in your early career and i know you mostly from working in shops along the south coast how many shops did you end up working in uh lots lots so um at 14 i worked in a tiny little reptile shop in Chandler's ford that did not last very long called long island reptiles um i think i was there for about 18 18 months year 18 months i think that lasted but it but it it went bust pretty quickly um I then I then worked at um, the Reptilarium in Bournemouth for um, for for a couple of years um, while at university while I was at university, and then um, I went and got I went and got a proper job after university. I didn't like having a proper job, so I flicked that off, and I went and worked at Grange Reptiles, and um, yeah, you know, helped build and open the big reptile shop that you know that is still standing is that is Grange Reptiles. Then uh, after that, I went to Marwell. I went to Marwell after that. Yeah, and then and then I left Marwell. Then I went to Peregrine, and I was a Peregrine rep for a while, which is a dreadful, soulless job. And then I went to Southampton Reptile, where I was for a couple of years. And then I went to The reptile room up in Blackpool car. That took me. That, that was far. I had to think far too hard about that. Sorry, still a bit, still a bit dusty from travel. But yeah, then I went to um, the reptile room up in Blackpool. So yeah, I've, I've bounced about a bit. Yeah, I sort of. I seem to do about two year stints and just uh, get 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 itchy feet and leave and go to something else. So obviously, you must have met so many different people and so many different ways of doing things. What yeah. do you think that did for you as your development as a keeper and also for your career as well? The best thing about moving on semi-regularly and having the exposure to the number of people that I had exposed, I had exposure to was being able to take, take a little something from, you know, more or less everyone, everyone knows something that you don't 
Um, everyone does something slightly differently to you. And sometimes the newest, greenest keeper that you're having a conversation with will go, oh, I've actually started doing this because of this. And you know, I find myself going, that's low key brilliant. Like that's absolutely outstanding. What an incredible observation. How have I never thought of that? And um, it's having lots of those moments over the years, but I feel that I've really been able to hone and polish my own craft and, um, you know, get, 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 get to a point where I'm, you know, pretty, pretty confident in what, what, what it is I do and, um, you know, you know, my knowledge base and, and yeah. And that's, that, that's probably the, that's probably the best, best part of that for me. And also you see a lot of how not to do things, you know, it is absolutely possible to learn from other people's mistakes and, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for those opportunities as well. Yeah, I th- I think you're describing as even like these new keepers that might just have some light bulb idea that's like, oh my god, I'm going to use that now. How important do, do experiences like that um, lean into making you feel about gatekeeping in the reptile hobby and how people don't really give someone the time of day if they're not really, you know, 20 years in the hobby, 30 years in the hobby? What attitudes do you think that built up in you towards that? I, I I don't believe I have any aspect of gatekeeping to myself whatsoever. I love talking to people about reptiles and the science around reptile keeping, husbandry, herpetoculture, herpetology, be it, you know, or field work, whatever it is. I love talking about it. It's, you know, it is absolutely intrinsically who I am. So I I, I like talking to people from all walks of life about these things. I mean, naturally, I'll have conversations with people. And I will not enjoy talking to that person based on who they are as an individual. You don't, you don't like everyone just as not everybody likes me and, that, and that's fine. Um, but in terms of, in terms of, you know, gatekeeping or guarding knowledge, I think it's, I think it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to cause irreparable damage to, to the industry and, and, you know, the only people that really loses out is the animals. So, you know, why do it? You know, if there's something I know that can make an animal's life better, why wouldn't I share that information? Hundred percent agree with that. So, did you ever see a lot of gatekeeping at the time, alongside um, having these moments of having these light bulb moments from these brand new, fresh keepers that really made you feel like, yeah, I will never do that, even seeing someone else do it next to you, sort of thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, um, there's always been there's always been um, uh, quite macho attitudes um, with certain areas of reptile keeping, in particular. Um, you know, gatekeeping in the venomous community is is rife. You know, people behave like, you know, keeping keeping hots is the most difficult thing in the world. It isn't. You just have a different set of protocols around, you know, handling restraint and, you know, feeding and you and you take extra steps to make sure they don't escape. But looking after a cobra is no more difficult than looking after a corn snake. It's just more dangerous. That's interesting because I've never I've, I've, I've been around venomous and and dabbled, but I've not really been like, right, this is my thing. I'm going to do this now. I I know you did a lot of venomous in the past. So is, has that been one of your passions in the past, venomous? Um, I wouldn't single it out as a passion. I I I, I am interested in venomous snakes. I have I have passion for venomous snakes. Um, some taxonomic groups more than others. Um, I I enjoyed keeping venomous. Um, uh, you know I found certain aspects of it really really rewarding. Um, and I think the ability to learn how to deal with legislation um uh, uh response you know responsible keeping of um something that didn't just pose a threat to your well-being but potentially the the well-being of others around you that was um that was that was that was it was it was important learning for me and um i think it really really helps mold my mindset so that when i stepped into the zoo world i already had a lot of these things I already had a lot of these skills. I had a lot of I had a lot of understanding around some of this stuff, and um, it yeah definitely it definitely helped. It definitely helped you know mature me and sort of um, you know, sort of temper me as a keeper. But but yeah, I mean keep, keep, keeping keeping venomous is not the be all and end all, and it absolutely isn't for everyone. And and, and nor should it be, you know, nor should it be. So you talk about maturing and things tempering you. Were there any like really like key notable moments when you're working in these shops that you felt were like massive turning points for your de- development as a keeper? Any sort of like m- defining moments that stuck with you? Um, yeah, there's there's a couple of things that spring to mind. I took a couple I took a couple of bites that I shouldn't have taken. 
um, off of either monitor lizards or, 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 or large snakes where I was, I was going in overconfident and I should have, again, I should have, I should have read the animal's behavior. I should have been cooler, calmer and more collect. Um, and there was, there was a tough, I've, 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 I've had the misfortune of being whacked by, you know, some relatively large reptiles a couple, a couple of times now. And you know it was avoidable it was so avoidable and it, it it really really helps um sort of recalibrate my mindset and made me realize that working in a way that is not only safer for me is also safer for the snake or safer for the lizard and if we can if we can um achieve our outcomes either with very gentle persuasive handling or even better training um then that's there's there's worlds to be said for that you know one of the one of the things that i find interest being in the part of the world i am now is a lot of the attitudes around me towards crocodilians are, are still all about jumping on them and i'm like well let's ask my alligator to go into a box and she does you know well, why why jump on her why stress her out why 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 jaw rope her if i can literally ask her to go and step into a crate we close it up we take it to the vets we do what needs to be done then we release her you know the animal the animal has an exponentially better experience there's no risk to keepers you know everyone comes out of it better yeah training is something that has really been for the last couple of years been something that i've been really really into this everything i've got now apart from the bull python that i've just taken on is to some degree target trained now i've been yeah. able to get things to shift to and from places and from a hobby perspective, people are like, you can't train a snake, that, that they're not intelligent enough, that's impossible, that's not a thing. But from a zoo perspective, Rubbish. it's like, of course you can train a snake. Train near enough anything if you if you have the perseverance and you can find the right motivator. Yeah, I completely yes. agree with that. Yeah, you need, to, you need to find out what motivates it, and then you just apply the basic principles of operant conditioning and... You know, with the right perseverance and understanding motivators, you can you can train most things. I mean, some things will take a long time to train. Some things it will be so slow and difficult it possibly isn't worth doing. But you can you can train most things. Yeah. So going back to obviously the shops, still I'm still focusing on the shops here. I obviously worked in a few shops now, and you know that you get to work with a lot of species in fast succession. Do you feel like that? aided you in growing as a keeper as well this just mass exposure to a lot at once it i feel rather than rather than helping my keeping abilities it just helped my base knowledge like i was becoming aware of species every time a new species would come in i'd make sure i knew common name scientific name where it came from what it's distribution yeah what, what its distribution was and a few key bits of information about it so that i was able to successfully sell it and make sure that I could responsibly and ethically sell it. But um, but I would seek seek information from elsewhere and try and basically do a lightweight setup because I knew the animal was only going to be there effectively in transit. You know, it was going to be in, in my care for a short period of time before it left. And I wasn't able to meaningfully deep dive any of the husbandry of any of the species that were being kept in a shop because i wasn't about to start building hibernaculums for species that hibernate i wasn't about to start you know fully rewiring the enclosures to to you know meet the specific needs of that that specific species it had to be it had to be quite generalist and you know you you almost could sort of chalk it up to like one of five settings you know cold temperate you know you know, hot, humid, cold, humid, and you, you, you sort of knew where it was going to slot into. You try and put it in a bank with other species that it was going to best work, but there was no, there was no, there was no deep diving husbandry. It was all very, it was all very, very much sort of like triage. I got really good at setting up vivariums, though. Yeah, it's almost as if like you're just skimming over the surface like a stone, skipping the water almost. Yeah, it's a really good analogy. That's a really good analogy. So. Along those lines, then, was there any species that you really enjoyed working with that you wish you just got that little bit more time to really flesh out some experience with? I mean, there's always something. There's so little time and there's so many species. Um, 
I kept, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you know, but I, I kept pretty intensively at home as well. You know, I'd go to work for eight hours and look after reptiles and I'd come home and look after reptiles for two to four hours in my evenings. And then normally two full eight hour days, you know, maintaining my own collection, you know, on, on my days off, you know, at, at one point I had, I had friends, I had friends kind of working for me, paying, paying off snakes that I'd given them. You know, it was, it was pre pretty full on. Um, so I, I've been pretty fortunate that the majority of things that I've really, really wanted to keep and really wanted to stuck my teeth, get my teeth stuck into, I've been able to, there's a handful of species that, um, are not available, um, either legally or, um, or full stop that I, you know, that I would have loved to have kept and I'd, you know, to this day, I'd love to work with. Um, but, but, you know, there, there there's always going to be limitations and you you know you have to you have to you know accept the fact that you know not not ev not everything's here to be kept in captivity so let's go into what you kept because i i knew you had a big collection i didn't realize it was as big as you're describing here so could you give me like a from your brain's memory a list of things that you've you've kept in the past so how long we got <laughs> um uh, I think the, the sort of key notable ones would be um, uh, crocodile monitors, uh, uh, yellow tree monitors. Um, yeah, bunch of bunch of bunch of Australian dwarf monitors. I was I went for a, went for a real stage of those um, at at one point. Um, uh, Boland's pythons. Um, a few a few of the a few of a few of us. Uh, Somalia, they're Somalia now. They're not Marilia anymore. Yeah, a few other Somalia species, um, Clastolepis. Um, uh, yeah, Clastolepis were a particular favourite. Amethystina. Yeah, a few, a few, a few of those um, sort of Indonesian scrubs, which are real, real passion for a while. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of green tree, green tree pythons. I had a real green tree python problem for a while. I, I think I probably single handedly kept uh, Crystal Palace afloat with my green tree python purchases from them for quite a while, which um. Which was uh, which was awesome. They're all they're, those guys are always really good to me. Um, I kept some locality super dwarf ticks. Uh, I kept more super dwarf ticks, but that was more to fund my fund my um, uh, reptile re reptile edition and uh, help pay the electricity bills. Um, what else did I keep? Um, ah, Chinese alligator. Uh, had the Chinese alligator. Kept a you know, wide wide variety of venomous snakes, everything from um, Western green manders, king cobras. Saw scale vipers, a few species of rattlesnake. Um, I had a, I had leucistic monocle cobras for a while. That's the only only more only more venomous I ever kept. And, uh, some some of the photos of um, those went 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 viral, and uh, I was forever seeing them everywhere. Um, yeah, Buzzfeed latched onto them. Uh, rare, rare albino cobras, um, which was particularly funny. But yeah, um, pancake tortoises, uh, abronia. Um, all, all, all sorts of. Uh, I've kept. I've kept a lot over the years. I've kept a lot, a lot. Yeah, there's a. There's not a great deal that I've wanted to keep that I that I haven't. For, you know, fortunately, unfortunately. That is quite a highlight reel. That is. I think a lot of those species are some people's end goals, and you're like, yeah, I've, I've done that. So you've you've kept yeah. a lot a lot of things then. Yeah, absolutely. There was there was there was a really cool point in time where I had a I had a Chinese alligator, a couple of bolands, and they um and a and a, a crocodile monitor. And at that point, at that point in my keeping life, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of done. This this is it, you know. What what, what do you keep now? You know, uh, you know, if because if, if I could keep a komodo, I wouldn't. It's not practical. You know, if I could keep a galap, I wouldn't. It's not practical. You know, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna be able to afford to spend a million dot a, a million pound on the on the house on the housing it requires so you know i was never going to keep a good lap but yeah i was um very very fortunate yeah very intense but i can imagine that was really fulfilling like croc monitors are incredible oh they're the best i'll I'd, I'd I'd take a salvador over, over over a komodo any day i absolutely love salvador if um if there was one thing i would if there was one thing i have to do before i die it's see a wild salvador i that would be very cool. So obviously you're keeping all of this and you have this, this wider range of experiences as well as working in the shops as well. Did you come up with any sort of like techniques for educating customers that you developed over the years? Um, I mean, it's sort of the same thing as what I said earlier, really. I mean, um, having so many different conversations with so many people and, you know, working alongside so many people, you know, some of them, some of them really, really good at what they do. Um, I 
just picked up bits and bobs from others, you know, from other people. But you know, so, so, science communication isn't easy. Science communication is um, is you know, it's a, there's a real art to it. And I got better. I got better. I got better. I got better at it as we went along. But I think I think the if I had one, if I had one piece of advice to give to somebody that was you know, in that position, trying, trying to, trying to, um, um, you know, have these conversations, it would be to try and make your content relatable. Don't talk about UVA, UVB, IRA, uh, IRB, IRC. Most people, you're going to lose most people. They're going to, they're going to go, oh, oh yeah, oh yep, 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 yep. You know, talk, talk, talk about it in terms they understand. Go this lamb here gives the same as the sun which is what this animal needs this one gives less of it this one gives a better balance of it but this is the one you know in terms of from the sun to this product this is this is this is it you know everyone gets that you know everyone understands that providing heating and lighting is all about replicating the sun just tell them this is the one that best replicates the sun and if they want a deeper explanation then you can go into it but for most people that's enough because if you just go ah oh, you know if 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 you if you bore them with the details they're not really going to understand, and they go, "Oh, I'll, I'll take the ceramic because that's what I've always had. I, I trust ceramics; they last a long time." Yep, but we know we know it's not right, and um, and that's the way, and that you know that that that's the way I always I always I always try to operate that, and um, never ever make anyone feel stupid. Never ever ever make anyone feel stupid. You know, if someone gets something wrong, um, by all means correct them, but just be really really careful with your mannerism. Be be really con- con- you know considerate in how you are going to challenge that viewpoint. And, um, and yeah, you know, I, I've, I've been, I've been in shops when someone said something that's you know, pr- pretty outlandish and th- they've been mocked. That person has been made to feel stupid. That person has been made to feel unwelcome. And that person's likely to double down on what they're doing and, you know, al- almost put up a barrier to f- further advice and that doesn't benefit anyone. Very solid advice. I think the, the, the initial reason that I even started this YouTube channel is because I was just I, re- I got into realizing that for some people this is very complex and stuff. So I would like to make a video for each time someone that asked me something more detailed, especially online as well. I could be like, here's the link. You can rewatch this over and over and over again. Um, and it made things yeah. easier for me. And then it became its own its own beast. And now it's just my entire thing. Yeah. But initially it started like trying to make supplemental material to make that life easier for people. I yeah. think that it's difficult because some people I, I've had some times where you say it that way and then they're like, cool. If you go into science, you, I find sometimes you can get someone to understand why they want to do something rather than why you've told them to, because they go, Oh, I understand now. Oh, I actually want to do that. But then some people do the reverse, like you say, and they're like, and don't want to know. So yeah, it's all about delivery. And, and, and also, picking picking your audience if you've got if you've got you know somebody who just wants to get their first beardy you know uh, isn't interested in the technical stuff whatsoever you're gonna you're gonna pitch why you're giving them this stuff very very differently to somebody who's maybe like a last year zoology student they want to keep a particular species so that they can you know correlate captive observations to wild ones you go hard on the science you know let them know but yeah you know it's um it's a uh, you know it's sort of knowing your audience it's kind of like you know if, if ever if ever i'm you know presenting or, or doing any public speaking i always make sure i always make sure i know who i'm pitching it to because you know how i'm going to pitch to you know colleague you know colleagues at another zoo versus a bunch of um bunch of you know, year 11 year 11 school kids it's very very different yeah i think it's just it's also a skill set in yourself trying to become more adaptable. And what I found early on is that I struggled to leave the science out of it because I felt like I didn't give everything that I had up here. But I think over time you learn to let that go as well. Yeah, absolutely. A- absolutely. You know, not everyone needs to speak exclusively in scientific names. That's not right for some situations. Others, it's absolutely right. You know, it's how, it's how it goes. But yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Do you find there's a difference between someone who's just going to be a pet keeper with like, oh, I want a bit of dragons, a family pet, versus someone who's a hobbyist who wants to fill an entire room? And do you think you can tell that by gauging sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think 
I think you never know who someone's going to become. There are, you know, there are absolutely times where someone's come in to get a pet and they've gone, Oh, this is for me. And then within, you know, within you know, a year, 18 months, two years, they've got a lot of reptiles and, you, you know, they're coming in and they're like, Oh, I want to get one of these. And I'm like, slow down. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But, but, but equally, you know, some people, some people, you know, think, think, you know, reptile keeping is going to be for them. They get a snake and go, oh, this is nice for me. I think it's really boring. Do they not do anything? Nope. Not really. <laughs> Yeah, some people are like that as well. So you talked about like reptile shops always being like triage. How do you feel about bioactives in a reptile shop? How do I feel about bioactives in a reptile shop? Um, <sighs> depends on the shop. It depends on the shop. I mean, how many shops have got decent quarantine facilities? It's, it's not many. Just they just chuck stuff in. So in if you had a proper quarantine facility, I'd be I'd be all about it. But as and when you're rotating animals through, I think non-bioactive and cleaning and hygiene and keeping in more sterile, almost hospitally triage setups, substrate, furnishings, equipment is 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 probably better unless it's unless it's like a long long term resident. Um, I'm 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 very very pro bioactive. You know I I I, I wish more people and places would do it. I'm 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 not convinced a reptile shop's necessarily the right place for it. And you know pr- pr- unless of course they have a decent quarant- quarantine protocol. But my guess is that there are not any reptile shops that are sitting on reptiles in a separate facility for thirty days, screening them while they while joining the main collection in the shop so moving on from shops then obviously you said you moved to to marwell you made this big step up from um from a shop to a zoo environment did it feel like a big step up or do you feel like you walked straight into it and you were quite comfortable um i was i'll I'll be honest i was pretty comfortable in the space um i was working with species i would worked with previously um just on a larger scale um the intensity of the style of keeping was reduced so i was able to spend more time focusing on individuals rather than so you know so so much of what i did was co- managing a collection um you know privately and at zoos sorry privately and at home where um privately and in shops sorry car got there in the end um but when i went to a zoo Every, everything was an individual you had an opportunity to manage things as individuals and that was that was that was that was nice to have that bit of breathing space and you know to really observe your animals and um you know understand the sort of you know the seasonal shifts they were going going through so i um i really enjoyed stepping into the zoo space and um yeah I, it, it felt it felt very comfortable you know at, at that time it, it wasn't something like it wasn't you know it's not something i'd say i found uh, daunting or stressful Obviously, being able to observe and like focus on the individual. Did you feel this sort of like moment where you were like, "Oh yeah, they like." It sounds staffed because I think everyone knows that animals have individual personalities. But I think you go, having experienced it all myself, just up until recently, you go into a shop environment, and I think that you focus so hard on like, right, water, da 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 da. You're just going through, and then you're like go into a situation where you can focus on the individual you're like oh yeah they do have individual personalities oh yeah i can just watch what it does now i can cater it to this and that it's i think it takes you back and you're like oh yeah i can't describe i can't describe what i'm trying to get at but i think you understand i I, I absolutely understand so um with my private collection over over a 10 10 year period i sort of i i i sort of you would I'd sh- uh, shrink it shrink sh- sort of shrink and shrink and expand and i would go I've, I've got too much i'm literally just looking after these things i'm not enjoying them in any way shape or form so i'd shrink my collection and then it'd be super manageable and i'd enjoy everything and i'd be making observations and i'd be i'd be you know getting really good results and i'd be like oh this is great i was like i've got i've got time to take on a couple of pairs of these yeah i could take on some of these and then grow and grow and grow and then you know something you know something would take my fancy and i'd give it a go and i had the space and um you know i'd i'd, I'd end up sort of expanding to the point where i'm like oh i'm, I'm just doing it non-stop again it's you know it's, it's all consuming and then I, then i'd shrink uh, okay 
sorry uh, so, so um so yeah you know I'd, I'd realized that my collections were constantly growing and shrinking and i would you know I'd get to this point where i'd decide that it was no longer manageable and i wasn't enjoying it anymore and i'd shrink right down but it was always too easy to increase again after i'd shrunk um but i was always i was always happy when i was doing i was always happier when i was doing less um because when you've got a big collection one of two things is going to suffer the animal welfare or the keeper's welfare and um for me personally it was it was it was always keeper welfare i didn't i didn't have a life outside of my animals particularly i you know it's, it's what i did all the time you know you know you know just running myself ragged and um it wasn't actually sustainable it was only because i was young and energetic that i think I got- yeah um i think a lot of us um go through it of uh I've heard that that story over and over and over again of people like building up, cutting down, building up, cutting down. My friend came on my podcast and he described the same thing of like he would have these huge collections and cut down and do the same thing. And now he's up to a stage where he's got a lot of monitors. He's up, I think he's up at that peak and now he's talking about cutting down again. So it happens time and time again. Why is it you think that we do that? Uh, because we're all addicts. We're, we're all we're all totally and utterly. Uh, 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 those of us to get to this point, we're absolutely fanatical about what we do and giving over our lives to these animals that intrigue us, that we love, that you know, that are our, our reason for being. It's, it's really easy to do. It's a, it's a price none of us seem to mind paying, particularly in the moment. And it's only when you start, you know, dealing with the long term effects of it, you go. Oh, okay. All right. Something's got to give here. You know, something's got to give here. You know, I, I'm aware of the fact I've su- I've sacrificed personal relationships um, because, or I've damaged, I've done, I've done damage to personal relationships because you know my my animals came first, and the amount of time and energy I put into those animals meant that I wasn't putting time and energy into other things that you know I probably should have been putting time and energy into. I did it. I did exactly 20. that. Yeah, I did that as well. Yeah. Hindsight, exactly. So when you moved, obviously you moved into these zoos um, and you were used to the animals and you were getting more time with them as individuals. Did you notice any sort of attitude shifts from like the environment of a zoo compared to herpetoculture? Did you notice any attitudes towards herpetoculture, private herpetoculture, that you felt were quite different? The attitude in zoos as I've experienced it, um, towards herpetoculture is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I've met everything from zookeepers that think private herpetoculture should be outright banned and they don't believe in it in the slightest. And, you know, these, you know, these, 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 these people shouldn't be keeping these animals through to, you know, there's, there's zookeepers that, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we all know that are, um, that are as, you know, deep into herpetoculture, you know, as they are, as they are the zoo world, you know, they sort of have one leg in both camps, which is very much what I was when I was at Marwell. That's, that's, that's very much, that's very much who I, who I was when I was at Marwell. Although not, not so much in New Zealand as I, as I, I don't, I don't keep anything privately anymore. Oh, wow. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. Cause I find that interesting as well. Again, like I said about the shops, was there any memorable moments for you from your time at Marwell? That you felt like a big change in the way that you view keeping of reptiles. I think the interesting thing for me was seeing relatively common species, or, or you know, well, your or common, yeah, well kept species that um, you know I'd spent the last how many years telling people did just fine in a two by two by four viv, living in sort of sixteen foot, you know, by eight foot by 10 foot enclosures utilizing all the space utilizing you know everything we gave them and going oh i'm not sure i'm not too sure these minimum standards we roll out in the shops are actually anywhere near near adequate you know it's the size it's the size you can keep it in without it you know until it you know without it dying and again you know that's a very 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 low bar not killing something is a low bar yeah i mean i i think the same when i go to a a zoo the thing that i like the most is seeing species that i'm familiar but kept like crazy well so like i always want to see some like bearded dragon enclosure that's like gargantuan 
or like there's one at crocodiles of the world where they have like green tree pythons but this huge like 10 foot like floor to ceiling thing and to see them active and moving and changing position like it's just crazy compared to like these two by two by two uh by two enclosures some people keep them in yeah it, yeah yeah oh yeah Green, green green tree pythons are often sold as you know oh they don't do anything they just saddle perch and feed rubbish absolute rubbish the majority of um the majority of what we do are green tree pythons in captivity particularly particularly when i when i um when i was doing it and just before i left um based based on sort of you know wild wild, wild observations from friends is it's so wrong it's so wrong you know it, it kind of works but it's it's not how they live I think that's probably the most the case for most species that we keep as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what made you go from obviously like a zoo environment back to shops again? Um I was at Marwell at quite a turbulent time um in its in it in its existence. Um they were undergoing quite a major restructure. The reptile and invertebrate team was very, very small and um you know very very overlooked it was it was it was nobody's priority um and uh, there was a you know dedicated passionate team of um of um you know ectopherm keepers there at the time and I, I just don't think any of us any of us particularly felt like the collection was heading in, a, in 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 the direction we wanted it to go in there was immense there was an immense amount of red tape and it was difficult to make any meaningful husbandry changes particularly as just an entry-level keeper which which is which is what i which is what i was taken on as um so that was that was that was that was really challenging you know having to ask permission to change a light bulb is exhausting and um i i stand by the fact that there was there was real challenges in the organization which i struggled with but equally you know i, I definitely lacked, lacked a little bit of maturity to um approach situations with uh, a calmer, more level head, and um, yeah, I am. Um, I, 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 I just don't. I just don't think Marwell was in the right place at, the, at you know at that time in its history, and I and I and I and I wasn't in the right place for it. So I, I went. I went back to sort of what I what I knew, which at that at that time. So you went from experiencing them in these big enclosures and all of this, and you went back to the shops. How did this change how you? you educated or your perspectives what you thought about minimum standards and things like that how did that change how you operated as someone working in a shop after all of that uh i i so i introduced um i can't remember what i called it. i think it was pro i introduced uh pro packages for um for the housing and keeping of of you know lots and lots of commonly kept reptile species and you know uh, we sold the bare minimum because we had to we, we we had to sell the bare minimum because that was somebody's price point and if they didn't buy it from wherever i was working they would buy it elsewhere um which potentially is um a slightly slightly topsy-turvy attitude to have looking back on it but it was you know it, it wasn't I, I didn't own the shop i just worked there so had i um had i wiped out you know all beardy sales because i was 150 pound more expensive than the competition i don't think i'd have been very happy. i wanted to give people the opportunity to have a package which was the best possible husbandry for their for their animal and um they were they were they were, they were quite popular because if you if you tell somebody that this is this is how they do best by their by their animal by their you know particularly for, by their pet you know when people are buying a beardy as a pet they quite often do it because you know no no nobody nobody wants nobody wants to think that their animal is not not having a good time you know is is receiving less than I think recently, obviously I've experienced it more recently, is quite often you'll get some people who you walk around and be like, you can do this, this, and this, and this. And some people that walk around and be like, okay, okay, okay. And you can get to like well over 500 pound set, uh, setups for like a bearded dragon. And you know that a bearded dragon's walking away and it's going to have such a good life. So I, I think that some people are just willing to spend anything, which is brilliant. Yeah. I, I remember I had a chap come into um, uh, one of the shops once wanting a emerald tree monitor. And I was like, this is what you can keep it in. This is what you should keep it in. This is what I would keep it in. This is gold standard. 
And you know, he almost looked to me like he was an idiot, like like an in it, like as an idiot. And he's like, "Why are you telling me anything that isn't gold standard? You know, come on, man. You know, when we're not here to mess about, hook me up." And um, you know, you name it, he 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 bought it. And um, you know, there, there was a point where I'm, I said I, I recommended getting a Miss King. I was like, "Look, I'd get a Miss King." I, so um, yeah, I wanted to recommend a Miss King to this customer, and so I was really honest and transparent about the fact that it would make his life easier. The animal probably would benefit from it for you know the reasons you know we um but i was also really honest about the fact that it was in no way shape or form a necessity and um just that sort of honesty and transparency around what this product was what it meant for him but you know knowing that he didn't have to buy it you know he was like no have one awesome great thanks and um he, he even said it was the fact that i didn't try and sell it to him i i i, I floated it I, I gave him I gave him the benefits and that was that was good enough and he was like yeah sounds great I'll have that whereas um had I had I been like oh yeah you really need this mate he um he may have pushed back on it yeah I I think that often that is the way that a lot of people do spend more I I honestly don't like lying so especially when if someone is going to spend money on getting a setup and I think that's probably the best best policy trans, tra- tra- transparency and credibility are um, you know you 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 have to be you have to be honest transparent and cred and credible um when doing any of this stuff otherwise otherwise you won't be around for long wise words so you moved from the uk to new zealand what made you move to new zealand um new zealand made me move to new zealand um it is a glorious country uh the size of the uk with a with less people in it than there are in london all things that very much appealed to me um <laughs> i um i've always i've always i've always really enjoyed um the outdoors i've always enjoyed sort of um hiking mountain biking um all that sort of stuff and um there's no better in it no better on earth for it than new zealand so um small small population lots of space lots of greenery lots of wild places lots of incredible reptiles um a cheap and cheerful holiday day for me is now the blue mountain net mountains in um in australia which is it's pretty good yeah i'll, I'll take that over magaluf any day um yeah, so yeah I mean, there was a lot of lifestyle um drivers for my move to new zealand but I also had the opportunity to go and be a team leader at Wellington Zoo, who had an interesting collection, a couple of a couple of field programs, um, and I was just I was I was, I was, I was I'd managed shops, so I'd, I'd worked in management, I'd worked in sort of people leadership, and I'd had quite a lot of experience there. I'd worked in zoos, so I had so I had so I had a bit of zoo background, um, and I was just ready to go marry those two things and you know lead a team in a zoo, have um have a bit more a bit more um say and influence as to the you know how 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 it was all run and done and um i was i was just, I was just ready and I, I was ready to stop keeping privately as well you know i kept so i'm it became such a huge part of who i was um i was ready to let that go and um that was that was massively freeing that was massively massively freeing i think i've heard that a few times as well where People have gone into like work of zoos, or they became they were doing like dual setup of like working with them professionally and then keeping at home. And eventually, most people stop keeping at home. Yeah. Do you yeah. think it kills your love love for your private hobby by working in like as a, it as a job as well? No, it never killed my love. It never killed my love or passion, but my um, my priorities changed. I, I, I mean, I, I had to sell my entire collection to move to New Zealand. So all the animals had to go anyway. I, so I stopped keeping. I moved to New Zealand. I start this new job, and for the first time in for twenty years, I don't have animals that I'm responsible for privately, and. All of a sudden, a friend goes, "Do you want to go south to look for penguins for a couple of days on the weekend?" And I go, "Oh, okay, yeah, cool. I don't need to clean snakes, or or or, or, or any of those kind of things." And so, so there were so many opportunities I turned down, didn't didn't take up, and um and you know, there's so many things I missed out on because I had I had animals that always always required my attention. 
and I, I had this, I had this eureka moment um, quite, quite early on to my move to New Zealand, where I was like, I can, I can, I can do anything I want. I'm totally free. I can, I can literally do whatever I want. I can, I can go away for months at a time, and I don't have to bat an eyelid. And um, that was massively liberating. And uh, I think, I think the other thing that really, really um, helped helped my transition help help me wean wean me off my addiction was the fact that new zealand has some outstanding field herping so as and when i want to enjoy reptiles i can whack on a head torch i can go out go out to you know one of one of one of my locations and i can go and enjoy reptiles in the wild doing what they're supposed to do where they're supposed to do it um you know in their full glory and there's you know the the pleasure I, I, you know, the pleasure and the um, you know, endorphins I get from finding, particularly a new species in the wild for the first time, there is nothing. There's nothing that has ever come close to that um, in the in, in the whole time I was keep keeping and breeding reptiles. You know, that's 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 you know the gold standard for me. You know, that's uh, that that that's where it's at. They've got quite iconic species over there, so. We'll go into the field herping because that sounds amazing. But what species do you work with? Uh, natives or exotics? Or both? Uh, both. Let's go for both. Um, so we've got a relatively small but interesting exotic collection. Uh, just one, a uh, yellow-lipped um, uh, sea crate, uh, yeah, uh, lucky quarter co uh, colubrina, um, who's awesome and very very enjoyable so yeah she, she she is the only snake that i've worked with in the last seven 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 years which is a uh, pretty pretty funny considering i was predominantly a snake guy when i was um, back in the uk uh we've got a pair of um uh sundagario yeah to mr Mushigelli, who are absolutely awesome they're two girls about three and a half meters that i thoroughly thoroughly enjoy um we have a couple of couple of american alligator we've got a uh, herd of um breeding galapagos Giant tortoises, who are again, again real firm, firm favourite. We've got a uh, got a large group of lace monitors who who, who are good. We enjoy the lace monitors, and then we've got we've got a bunch of smaller smaller Australian lizards. Um, then yeah, a few few few. Uh, we got we got bell frogs and uh, exotic invertebrates. Nothing 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 too out there. Um, yeah, the exotic side of the collection is. It's quite small in terms of numbers, but they're large, large, large species that require quite a lot of management. So, in terms of native, what we got? Lots, lots, <laughs> and lots, and lots. Um, we've got three, four species of green gecko, gold stripe geckos. Um, we've got Duvacell's gecko, which is the largest species of gecko in New Zealand, about the same size as a toke, um, but uh, brown, brown or green eyes. We've got um come way through it. We've got we've got loads and loads of native skink species, grand skinks, otago skinks, um, cobble skinks, capatia skink, um, phallus skink, um, chevron skink. Yeah, lots, lots and lots and lots. Um and yeah, we are Tuatara, obviously. We've got got plenty of Tuatara who are who are probably probably my favorite native reptile probably they're pretty they're pretty spectacular they're um they're one of those things that you, you yeah it's hard to get it until you until you've seen one until until you've had one in your hand and you you know and you've really looked at it it's hard to get it but they are they are incredible you know they are so unlizard like it's unreal you know other than the fact that you know a quadrupedal reptile um we do we yeah we have um we have wetapunga we have um archie's frog um yeah we do we do a lot yeah we do a lot we got a um, bunch of a bunch of native fish oh we've got a bunch of exotic fish as well actually yeah we've got a big ar big arowana tank and a few other bits and bobs but yeah it's quite it's quite a large collection i assume some of the allure would be a lot of that is not available outside of new zealand as well oh uh, yeah so um one of one of the um one of the things I found really interesting going to New Zealand is that um a lot of a lot of key key interested in exotics and there's a lot of sort of buzz around the exotics. I'm like, no, no, I'm, that that's that's not what I'm here for. I'm here I'm here for your little green geckos. I'm here for your tuatara. That's that's uh that that's what I'm about. 
and um yeah working working with the uh new zealand native reptiles has been amazing like y- y- it it's hard to fathom looking for geckos at night with a head torch when they're as from the ground and finding them active like that's a lot to process as somebody that's only worked with exotic and sort of um you know warm region reptiles their entire life the idea of the idea of one of my reptiles you know when i I was in the uk going to like eight degrees would have terrified me you know you know the reptiles in new zealand i'm like eight degrees they're not going to breed they need to be colder need to be colder we need to get them down it's a funny dynamic that isn't it yeah 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 absolutely i saw some green geckos for sale in the in the uk recently yeah they're uh, they're pretty cool i don't know what yeah uh, is it because it's like the first ones imported were legal before it changed or something yeah so back in the 80s a i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure a pair of gray eye a pair of elegans and a pair of granulatus were oh and, and i think a pair of um maculata actually as well were legally exported to germany um and basically that one import has opened the floodgates and people are hiding um smuggled animals um at, 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 under, under under the guise that they've all been bred from you know one of those original pairs you know which is absolutely ridiculous yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, it was grey eye um, that I saw. They, they are, I've never seen them before, and I was like, "Wow, that is an impressive gecko." Grey eye are amazing. They get big as well. Big gecko. Yeah, big, solid, chunky gecko. And um, for, fortunately, there's um a few sites where they're really abundant. You know, a good, a good night. You know, a good night. A couple of hours herping, you can find eleven, twelve. I bet that's incredible. So when you go, go at herping, do you have, you say you have spots, is that for different species that you've like are trying to fine tune into finding? Yep. 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 So, um, um, I know, I know, I know, I know all the distributions of the animals I'm looking for. I know habitat preference. Um, and, uh, I, I either, I'm either targeting places where I know they've been seen historically or places where i think they should be and um and yeah norm- normally normally you're um normally you you, you know you, you, you can get you can get a result normally you can get a result in tuatara in the wild that must be pretty cool yeah tuatara in the wild are awesome yeah yep yeah, um i um i i got a horrible grainy phone picture of my first wild tuatara but didn't on me but um yeah my first wild tuatara was a pretty special animal it's big male as well big big chunky male yeah it was great you've uh yeah if uh, if ever you're in new zealand mate i'll take you to see a wild tuatara that that would be a life milestone that would be so what is it like working with tuatara then i can't even comprehend what it must be like yeah that they're really interesting animals they're really they're, they're really really subtle um it, it would be really easy to think that tuatara don't do anything and they're just they're quite they're quite switched off because it's shut it's subtle shifts it's small tells it, you know it's it, it's it's almost the, it's almost like the unsaid things that that, that that you know what's up with them and um i found i found that you know working with tuatara i've, I've, I've really really had to you know dial into not only the not only animal and the species but but the individuals as well but um, yeah, I um, I mean, I've I've been working with Tuatara a, a lot for the last seven years, and I, um, there is uh, not a single part of me that is bored of Tuatara. You know, I love Tuatara. I think they're great. Um, you know, seeing them in the wild, working with them in in the zoo, bring them in the wild, um, do it get you know going on a release. You know, actually, you know, getting to release some of the animals that we've you know we've been working with back to the wild. That's 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 gold standard stuff in my opinion. Yeah, it doesn't Sounds get much better than that. Very fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the subtleties, what is it? They just kind of like squint and look at you a little bit, or what, what um, are the things that it's, it's you know, not noticing them basking when they'd normally be basking. It's um it's uh, the, you know the way they may be holding themselves it's it's uh, not 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 noticing that they've um you know you know so s- certain individuals will like 
every single night they'll 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 foul their water bowl they'll drag themselves through it um you know and if that's not happening you know maybe something's off maybe they just weren't active that night you know uh the digging or not digging of test of test burrows you know the slightest slightest sort of shifts shifts in the females um uh sort of bo- you know, body shape you know when approaching uh of, of ovulation it's yeah it's um it's it's yeah it's, it, it's 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 quite hard to articulate what i'm what i'm trying to say but you know a snake ovulates and it blows up it looks like a swallowed a football but with um with um with totes it's all it's all far more sort of nuanced what are some major differences that you have found between what it's like to work with those versus lizards is there anything anything there that's like wow that sets them apart other than what they look like um There's such there's such diversity and variation in lizards. It's it's sort of hard to separate it out because there are lizards that you, that it, they're very very crocodilian in their care. There's lizards that are very very sort of chelonian in their care. So I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't it'd be hard to pin down sort of like oh this is really not lizardy. But the fact they're happiest at sixteen degrees sixteen degrees is their happy place. You know that that's when they're most active that's when that's that's optimal they're they're still active at three or four degrees you know that's that's you know that's absolutely acceptable temperature for a tuatara to be feeding and doing stuff and um those those things are weird that's i mean that's really weird um the fact that they their metabolism just runs so much cooler and they lay eggs you know that they, they they are a they are a you know temperate cold adapted egg laying reptile whereas just about every other other reptile that's um cold adapted it's it's it, you know re- realistically it's a it, it's 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 a live bearer you know you know new zealand new zealand's got two species of reptile that lay eggs the egg laying skink sufficiently weird enough to be named the egg laying skink and to atara and there's a 123 124 species of reptile in new zealand quite a lot then yeah, yeah and, and the rest of live bearers. Everything else is a live bearer. So when it comes to incubation then, do their their eggs incubate at a much lower temperature as well? Yep. Yep, yep. And they've also got um uh, temperature sex determination, so uh warm warm as boys, cold as girls. What are the boundaries for temperatures for those then? Oh, you... I'd have to I'd have to double check it, otherwise I'd be pulling numbers out of the air and uh, I wouldn't do that to your podcast, mate. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, the green geckos, obviously, are they very, very, very cool in, in terms of like the, the way that their eggs are or, or incubation, things like that? Uh, live bearers. Live bearers, they are, aren't they? Yeah, you just said, yeah. So, um, yeah, they have uh, two offspring once a, one, once, once a year um, and uh, different reporters report different things, but it looks like they'll have two seasons on, one season off-ish, but there's obviously variation dependent on location, species, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, that's um that's kind of the rule rule of thumb for um for for almost almost all of New Zealand geckos. But yeah, they're um oh they're absolutely spectacular. They're um in, in, in my opinion, effortlessly some of the best geckos in the world. They're like everything that's awesome about a gecko combined with everything that's awesome about a banded iguana in a gecko. And um yeah, I re- I really, really enjoy um Nautinus. Yeah, Nautinus are absolutely awesome. So you've um, obviously you don't keep anymore, and you go out field herping. I've seen a lot of photography yep. um, you sharing on Facebook and stuff. Is that because yep. obviously your main itch now is the field herping? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, I I don't I don't photograph captive animals, so I have I have I have no interest in photograph captive captive animals. I you know I I will do it to test equipment or to play around with settings or to practice, but um, everything I post pictures of is. All, all wild yeah i only i only i only photograph and post post wild animals that's my that's my that's my that's my thing that's my that's my that's my passion in life field herping and photographing and and, and yeah photographing them yeah I, I do like the sound of that i i my, my, my relationship with herpetology has changed as i've got older um i uh, for 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 me you know, I, did, I mean, don't get me wrong. This is no criticism of anyone that does any different, because you know, I, I've I've been a keeper. I've kept huge numbers. I derived a huge amount of pleasure from it, and it made me the person I am today. But 
where I've kind of got to is I enjoy them in the wild exponentially more. And I am very fortunate and, you know, I recognize privileged that I, I, I get to go and see these things in the wild. Like, I'm a little, I'm a little bit dusty today because of, I've just, I've just got back from Morocco. I've spent um, four nights, five days herping Morocco, going and seeing a bunch of species that I've always dreamt of seeing and I've, I've got to go and do it and that was awesome um 20 25th i, I leave the uk I, I i start heading home but i've got a five-day stop over in singapore where i'm going to be going for reticulated pythons king cobra um you know a whole slew of um you know pit, pit vipers and a few other bits and bobs that um i i'm privileged enough to have the opportunity to go and do that and that's what that's what drives me now you know i'm i i, I don't i don't want to keep a king cobra i want, I want to see one in the wild you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to keep a Komodo. I, I want to see one in the wild and, and ideally photograph it and get a good photograph that I can, you know, high five myself and pat myself on the back with. So you're just traveling the wild, taking pictures of wild animals now. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And, um, I'm no doubt it's going to hurt my credibility and my reputation, but I, I'm starting to like birds as well. I think that's a true sign of getting old and becoming a twitcher which is uh, embarrassing. And yeah, you might need to cut that out, actually. I don't, I don't know if I can have the world know that about me. I mean, birds are reptiles, so. Yeah, they just got lost along the way. <laughs> yeah. So the, the questions that I wanted to ask you is about the hobby in New Zealand. Obviously, I know it's yeah. regulated, but what can you keep as a private keeper in New Zealand? Um, the majority of the natives. The majority of natives you can, be, you can keep privately um uh so so i'll start by saying one of my favorite things about the private hobby in new zealand is native reps no financial value zero nothing it is illegal to sell them so it all operates on giveaways and swaps so you want you want to keep some you want to keep some rough geckos get permitted and ask somebody you want to keep duva sells geckos you want to you want to keep every single species of green gecko go for it just get your permit and that, that that's how that works you you know you, you 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 will have to start out keeping some easier species to prove to the breeders and prove to the people that are big in big in the game there that you can do it but there's nothing stopping you from doing so absolutely nothing and that's great because there's no appetite for um domestic poaching you know no no doubt no doubt it happens a bit but there's no appetite for it because it's not like you can go go to the you know west coast pick up a couple of tuberculatus and know that you're going to be able to sell them for a small fortune which is one of the problems they have in australia you know pair of i'm pretty sure a friend of mine said a pair of nephros asper in australia are about 1400 1400 which is 800 pound give or take and you know, it's kind of hard it's you know it's it's kind of hard not to understand how there's people going I can go to this site, pick them up. They're already in the hobby, sell them and pay for a holiday halfway across the world or pay for something I really, really want. So that's, that's not an issue in New Zealand. It was fantastic. Um, but, but outside of natives, there isn't a lot to be kept. Um, legally we can keep the, uh, entire Pagona genus, but only Barbata and Viticeps are in the hobby. Uh, we can keep shinglebacks, but I believe there's only one pair privately and the person that's got them seems to be totally unable to breed them. Um, we can keep leopard geckos, which are common and, um, and you, we see a lot of, and keep water dragons, which are common and we see sorry, Australian water dragons only, only, um, in Telegama, um, which are, which are common and a lot of people keep, um, and, and Cunningham skinks. That's about it. That's about the whole lot. And obviously no snakes. No snakes. So the only snake in New Zealand is the crate at Auckland Zoo. The, the only legal snake. I have no doubt somebody's keeping something illegally because it's too easy. It's too easy to smuggle stuff in, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, I um I, I have I have no doubt um that the or I, I know for certain that the only legal snake in, in New Zealand is the is the crate at Auckland Zoo. That's um it's so alien to what most people know from like the UK and stuff. Yeah, it was a big adjustment for me, particularly being a being a you know almost fanatical snake guy. So obviously, many people this way um, in the West are like, no regulation, this that, uh, rah rah rah. What are the current attitudes in the New Zealand hobby towards it? Is it disliked or is it enjoyed? 
What's it like? Uh, I think I think New Zealanders know that know that um, it's the responsible thing to do, and um, so biodiversity in New Zealand is amazing, and their wild places are are recovering, um, and in some cases untouched. Uh, the UK, but you know, environmentally is so destroyed and degraded. It, you know, it's it, it's it's almost hard to care. I mean, we've lost so so much here. We've lost so much. You know, you know, you know what's what what's what's the issue with having a pet rac- rac- pet raccoon? And you know, it can it can join the you know swathes of other pests. Uh, um, I think New Zealand get it a bit more. And if all and if all of a sudden they would say, hey, we're thinking of letting in some new species the the general public wouldn't have a bar of it i don't think really I, I don't think there's i don't think there's any appetite for it whatsoever um and yeah you know there are there are keepers in new zealand who keep the few bits we've got oh we, we've got a few tortoises and tortoises and turtles as well actually i, I forgot to mention those but yeah there's, a, there's people in new zealand that keep you know keep what they can keep and look look overseas and dream of owning snakes and dream of owning iguanas and you know dream of having monitors and I get that. That's cool. But there's, there's just their wants are, are, are not, they don't even register versus, you know, the needs and wants of the country. And um, I'm, I'm personally all in support of it. It's like, if I could keep a snake again in New Zealand, would I? Yeah, probably. Um, do I think me keeping a snake's more important than the, you know, the, the biosecurity of, you know, some of the rare and endangered species that New Zealand have got currently thriving? No, absolutely not. No, not in the slightest. And I might be a responsible pet keeper, but you know, most other people, you know, most other people aren't. You know, you need to look at people. You know, the way people keep cats. You know, people's cats are going out decimating wildlife, totally unchecked. And um, you know, you, you say you've got cats and you keep them in the catio, and they're like, "That's cruel." <laughs> what? <laughs> what's cruel is having them eat every single song ball, songbird in a five kilometer radius sorry i said it would turn into a rant again at some point that's that's uh that's like the tip of my cat rant but no that's all good i like it i like it I, I feel the same way um can people keep tuataras privately in new zealand um in theory there is one person licensed to keep tuatara privately in new zealand who who does but there is not a lot of appetite from the department of conservation to issue um issue um licenses um and so there's an additional dimension to keeping um and 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 working in the conservation space in new zealand that um you know i i i I as a you know british person I considered when I moved there, and um, it was was really new to me. And that's um, uh, e- 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 like consulting with iwi, iwi consultation. And um, there are, you know, there is, a, a, sorry, a, an, a, an iwi is a, is a Maori tribe, and there are iwi who have um, a mana, well, or, which is government, sort of basically sort of power and govern, gov- governance over certain species. So if I wanted to keep a tuatara privately, I would have to do a consultation with Nati Kawata, who are the iwi who have governance with Tuatara and um and ha- and and get them on board before I even did my per- before I even did my permit application so you know the the idea of speaking to a um group of people from another from from you know another part of the country or you know in mostly in 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 the case of um uh in English um Herb to culture another another country uh, to get permission to apply for a permit to keep the animal i mean it's it's almost unheard of what it is you know and and, and, the, and it's the same process for the zoos so if if a british zoo was to want to keep to atara and receive to atara from new zealand they would have to fly members of iwi over to do a consultation and um have the conversation with them apply for the permit and then um members of iwi would fly with the tuatara and perform a ceremony um uh when when you know when the, to, to to welcome the tuatara to to their new homes and um it, again it's it's a, it's a it's a very very different landscape yeah it's a very different landscape it sounds i think chester zoo have them don't they they do yeah and um chest chest chester zoo flew nati kawata over and um yeah they worked with mana fenua to um you yeah, know do do to do the right steps to um you know have the have the tuatara come and come and live come and live there 
That's so cool. I didn't realize it was like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, any of the so we do, we do, we, we've got a fair few breed for release programs at the zoo, and um, we 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 have to we have to we have to deal with and manage with all, all the stakeholders. So it's often council, landowners, uh, iwi, and, and and ourselves, sort of al- almost at a minimum. So you know we're, we're uh, at, at the moment we're we're doing we're doing you know huge number of wetapunga releases and um yeah we're dealing with the, we're, yeah, we're dealing with all of those people to make sure that everyone's needs met everyone's happy everyone understands what we're doing and why we're doing it and we've got all the appropriate permissions um permissions and permits to do that um legally and in in, in a manner that mm-hmm. everyone's happy with it sounds cool though i i like the idea of that that level of appreciation for nature Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what's really nice with um, uh, the uh, Māori culture is the value and the appreciation they have for not only the land and the ecosystem, but the but the species as well. Yeah, they um they refer to them as um Tonga or ta- ta- Tawanga, um Tonga Tonga. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of that, despite the fact I've been there for seven years. My my um my tongue is still very British, unfortunately. Um, but the the the, the literal translation is treasure. You know, Tuatara are a Tonga species. You know, they are a treasure species. They are something precious, and um yeah, that level of value and cultural significance. I think I think more species could more species would benefit from having that. Yeah, I do wish the UK was more like that. It'd be much better. So, what did you yeah, uh, what did, what did you go find in uh, Morocco? Ah, uh, so um, I had I had I had a few particular targets. Um, I really wanted to see a wild Euromastic. I've never seen a wild Euromastic, so um, I got out and um, yeah, we um, we we saw we saw a few, and uh, I photographed an absolutely beautiful male um, uh, Euro, Euromastic uh, nigravensis, um, who's fluoro yellow absolutely incredible it was uh 42 degrees ambient um when we uh when we found him it was thermonuclear um but yeah he was he was pretty special um uh, saw 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 a, a very badly injured puff adder unfortunately he was he was the only puff adder we found but um he'd been he'd been hit with a rock and um was uh not in not not in too good shape but it was unfortunate because beautiful sub adult absolutely beautiful um but yeah i was um i'm I was particularly interested in seeing seeing um Ariettans. um got a brief got a brief look at a um uh, egyptian cobra um but it was very very quick just a juvenile and shot up shot off uh what else do we see oh there's there's a few few um few geckos i wanted to see um stenodactylus beautiful um or- orange and orange sort of red and yellow um red and yellow in the eye almost looks like the eye of Solron, which was um yeah turned up one of those and got some good photos of that um a uh, couple of species of tarantola but mostly i mostly wanted to see the helmeted geckos just because again hel- helmeted geckos beautiful animals absolutely beautiful and um in my time in new zealand i've become a bit of a bit of a gecko nerd you know ac- accidentally but yeah we t- turned up a bunch of a uh, bunch of really interesting gecko species um pretty quiet on the snake front there's the puff and the cobra but other than that it was just just a few whip snakes um but yeah it was uh it was it was quite hard work herping morocco um i've, I've definitely had m- more, more productive herping trips but it was beautiful beautiful um environment um and uh yeah absolutely 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 stunning in, um uh, ecosystem and landscape it was really enjoyable but i'm uh, i'm hoping i'm hoping to get back at some point because um i didn't i didn't find a tortoise i really wanted to see a wild tortoise um found several i uh, found several um gracia shells but no 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 live ones but um the again again you know seeing that they were just living in like xeric scrubland 40 degrees cactus succulents not not a leafy green on in, in sight um just living on sand and rock and uh you know it's not how we keep them that, that that's what they want but it's not how we keep it, it, it feels like most people give tortoises a basking spot of like 28 degrees you know a basking spot's probably close to 40 but yeah they're um yeah absolutely absolutely great seeing these animals where where, where they actually live and what I think I think if I was going to encapsulate something that I love so much about field herping, it's going and seeing these animals in the wild, where they live, how they live. You kind of gain a real appreciation for 
how we should be keeping them. And I don't think I've ever gone somewhere and seen a species wild and gone, oh yeah, we're getting this right. This this looks about right. It's always like, oh, why why on earth do we do this? Yeah, well, since since when's this the right idea? And you know, I um I know it's something that John Courtney Smith's really passionate about, but it's you know it's wild re- re- um recreation. You know, recreate the wild, take the best of it. You know, jog off the bits that don't serve the animals, but give them the best of it. You know, don't keep them in a boring, homogenous, 26 degree box that does nothing to serve them. You know, serve these animals, keep them well, you know, recreate the wild. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was enjoying that. So I just let you run with that. That was, that was. Yeah, so, sorry. Sorry. Like I said, I do, I do often, I do often get overly impassioned and start ranting. Yeah, I mean, I I feel very similarly, so I can understand that. Seems like you're really enjoying life now, then. Yeah, I I I'm I am very very privileged to get paid to do what I love. Um, I spend a decent amount of time in the zoo. I spend a decent amount of time in the field. You know, work working projects. You know, pro- professionally, not just not just herping for pleasure. Um, I I I I I have a very very good work life balance. Um, I have, I have excellent colleagues. I have, I'm surrounded by people that I can learn from and help me grow and, and better myself. And um, I'm, I'm doing it all in in a beautiful country. So I've got very, very little to grumble about. I still, I still try. I still, I still find the odd thing. But yeah, I'm, um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty privileged. You sound very happy. Yeah, I, I am. Yeah, thank you. I am. So we've got one more thing for you. And yep. the, the previous question from the last guest was, do you think there needs to be more species diversity in the hobby? Um, no, I'd rather we kept less better, which is probably probably really unpopular. That's probably a really, really unpopular take. But um, we keep so much so badly. There is totally inadequate literature on so much of what we keep. I, I reckon if there was... Uh, a a you know a list of 100 species that were well researched well documented that that you know most people kept i i i feel i i just i just i just feel like we would do better by those species and i know there are people out there doing incredible work with odd cryptic lesser known species and they are feeding in and they are feeding into um you know, conservation, they're feeding into zoos, they're, they're helping inform and educate people. But I think those cases are very, very few and far between. I think we spend a lot of time seeing people picking up cheap wild caught animals that they don't really understand that has cost a little bit of money because, you know, they're, they're literally, fre- fre- you know, fresh out wild and we, we don't know how to keep them and then they die. And it's a, it's a problem. And um, yeah, I'd rather people did less better. I... Have it's funny you say this because I was literally up the other what's been a week ago, and I was I was just thinking about things. So I was like, I've changed my mind, you know. So I uh, started, when... yeah. I was the opposite. I was like, more species diversity. It's like it's better that people work with more species so that education grows and we learn how to like do things which serves like that information going to zoos when things need to be done blah 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 i was just thinking like the other week i was like i uh i don't care anymore really i just want people to look after things really really well and i've slimmed down so much of what i think and do and uh, my entire like purpose of the channel now is just helping people do as well as they can do with what they've got i don't care about the politics anymore i don't care about Oh, uh, we what what what's about and whether we should keep X species and stuff. I almost I've gone the opposite. Where I started this podcast, ironically, this podcast that you're on was about highlighting breeders of obscure species in in the name of species diversity. And now I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> I've gone. Uh, cool. Welcome. Welcome to camp. Let's do less better. I I I I love species diversity. I think the biggest travesty of the morph game is that when I first started going ham, most tables had something different on it. 
There were species I'd never seen before. People were keeping interesting stuff. It excited me. I was interested. And then towards the end, it was just a homogenous sea of morphs. And, you know, your diversity was, is it a retic morph, a boa morph, a cresty morph, a beardy morph, a leopard gecko morph? And I don't care. I'm not interested in that stuff whatsoever. And it's driven the people that are keeping interesting stuff so niche that it's almost not sustainable because, you know, for some of these like slightly more obscure species, there's a pair in Europe or there's a couple of pairs in Europe and it can't be done like well and sustainably. And you you do it right or not at all. And if you have to re-import wild, wild animals every single time, that, that isn't sustainable in my opinion. That's, you know, taking animals from the wild just because you want to keep them isn't a good enough reason. Taking animals from the wild to establish a captive population for long-term captive breeding, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Obviously, everything has to start somewhere, but constantly replenishing replenishing to keep, you know, one pair of leaf-nosed snakes from Madagascar from the wild every couple of years. It's, this is not okay. It's just, this is not really right. In, in my opinion, you know, based on my personal ep- ethical compass, again, I've no doubt you'll have listeners that will go, What's this idiot talking about? And, th- and that's fine. You can think I'm an idiot. I don't mind. So uh, I think a general trend that you see is a lot of people think that if something's going to come in wild caught, that it should go to someone that's trying to breed the species and not to someone that's like it's a first pet reptile or something like that. If it's, in, if it's coming in wild caught, it, it should be breeding, not just becoming a pet. Others just been wasted coming from the wild. I think a lot of people think along those lines. But then I think yeah, that's I, my yeah, yeah. It's like if people want to establish like 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 toad headed agamas, um, it's Phy- Phyrencephalus mysticeus. They came in in reasonable numbers a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, and the majority of that import went to people that wanted to establish groups, breed them, and supply them to the hobby. Great, no issue with that. That is a I mean, some people will question whether or not wild wild collection of reptiles is okay or not. You know, till till you know till the cows come home, and that that's fine. But if there is going to be a reason for wild collection, that's it. But reimporting them every two years because you're killing them and you just want to constantly keep them, that's that's not okay. That's that that's that's not all right. And you know, you'd I'd be highly skeptical of anyone that went, oh no, that's fine. You know, there's plenty out there. You know, just keep sending them over and killing them. You know. So I am of the opinion if we're going to take stuff from the wild, it needs to there needs to be a concerted effort to establish a captive breeding population of it. And if it can't be done, leave them alone. Don't bother. You know, we know there are certain species that do miserably in captivity. And even when we put our best and brightest on it, they can just about keep them alive. So if it's one of those species, just leave them alone. Stop killing them. Stop, stop importing them en masse and killing them all. Because at, at some point, you know. It will, it will mean that people can't enjoy them in the wild and you know that and they're being removed from an ecosystem which they are an active participant in so you know just yeah just just sort of think about it really what do you think about positive lists yeah i'm pro positive lists has has new zealand changed your mind for that yeah it has it has um i mean if you know a positive list basically falls into the doing less better category. Um, it will mean that people can work collaboratively to manage, you know, the genetics of, 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 of the species being kept. And it will mean it, it, it will just sort of um, standardize things a little bit more. And it's easy to have a common standard when your species are common, when you, when it's, when it's a common species being dealt with. Um, and I think there is value in that. And also just from an environmental protection point of view, you know, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of reptiles that could be kept in the UK that if they were to escape and establish pose threats to our already heavily under pressure indigenous or sorry, native herptofauna. And, um, you know, the idea, the idea of, you know, a, a species of sn- a snake eating snake, which gets out into the new forest and wipes out smooth snakes, you know, that would be, you know, j- just, just because, you know, we're respecting people's freedom to keep whatever they want. You know that's that's not acceptable. You know, I um I often feel herpetologists can sound a little bit like um pro gun people. Oh, I, I, I'm allowed to do this. This is this is my right. Is it? Pretty sure it's not. 
it's not it's not it's not a human right to be able to keep whichever species of reptile you choose you know it's a it's a privilege and while and when people abuse privilege you know privileges get taken away some people are of the opinion that if you give an inch they'll take a mile in terms of like government government and regulation what do you think about that yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really aware of the fact that you know all these things I'm saying. Ten years ago, I would have been livid about it because I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I have reaped the rewards and benefited massively, you know, personally and professionally from the diversity of species I've been able to keep. You know, I, I, I benefited from that, and uh, and had you know when 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 there was all the threat you know when when the, the lacy act was you know um l- 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 looming over everyone in the states and you know we you know we didn't know what was going to happen with you know giant constrictors which you know most people should not keep giant constrictors the vast majority of people should not keep giant constrictors but you know even when that was looming you know i was, I was annoyed about that because i didn't think i at the time i didn't think it was fair that we had these things dictated to us but again, I think coming out the hobby, gaining some more perspective, perhaps maturing a little bit, and um, not being not being invested in it has sort of given me different perspective. I th- I think that it would is my opinion that regardless if it, if it's what everyone wants, would it not be a smart idea to come up with a um, draft positive list that's well argued for well evidenced and justified each species in the off chance that the government's like no we're going positive list so the, and the hobby can go okay here's our list it's been done all the work for you and worked out why and here's the evidence for and then the government would be like oh this is the easy option yeah we'll take that and then everyone's already kind of got what got what they wanted in there um rather than being dictated to by people that don't know what is actually applicable to the hobby and things like that yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I mean, the other advice I'd give if you're trying to draft a positive list is do it by genus, not by species. Mm, that makes do it, sense. Do it by genus, because um, because if you do it by genus, then um, that then uh, when tax not taxonomy changes, all you know, all of a sudden, you know, if they decided to split viticeps and there was viticeps and something brand new, and it turns out some had viticeps, some had this brand new thing. All the thing that was brand new would technically be illegal until um until um until such a time that there was an amendment in law. So I I I you know I, I would do it I would do it by genus. And there's nothing stopping you from having a lot of species. You could have a lot of species on a on a on, on a positive list. But but yeah, I mean I I I I I I would absolutely see merit in what in what you're suggesting if it ever did come to that. The only the only criticism I have of there being a well the, the biggest criticism I have of there being a, a um, positive list um, having lived in New Zealand is our positive list is so small and there's so few species you can keep people can't gain the same exposure and experience that, that like that I did growing up and if I speak to a private individual who's been keeping for 10 15 years who's kept it all it's it's about 11 species across a pretty narrow range. So it doesn't allow, it doesn't facilitate as easily for the same level of homegrown herpetologist that, that you get in, that you get in um, the UK. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the home, the, you know, the best of the Kiwi home, homegrown herpetologists who, who are outstanding, by the way, you know, standing, expand, standing, outstanding bunch of professionals. Um, they, they've all come through the native route. They've kept large numbers of natives. They've learned natives and they may have had an exotic or two just, just for something a bit different. But, um, but yeah, it definitely, it definitely sort of stifles and caps what can be done. I think some but of the yeah, main concerns, oh, sorry, there's a gap there. Right. Come on, carry on. I was just going to say that, but but I mean, but ultimately, there are there are pros and cons for both. I just think we need to make sure we're focusing on the right pros and the right cons, you know, and not just because I want to, but you know, because I want to is a really really weak argument. I think some of the issues of positive lists is that 
it's going to be the, the overwhelming opinion is that it's going to be struggle. It's going to be a struggle to enforce it. Like it happened in Norway and shit just went underground. Yeah. Um, Belgium yeah, yeah. shit's gone underground. Um, and it might cause more welfare problems from things not having access to veterinary care because it is illegal rather than what do you yeah, think about you can, that? You can, you can make the same argument with venomous snakes. There's a DWA license. Um, plenty of people keep without a DWA and that's a problem. But if you said to me, oh, should we should we remove the DWA and just let people keep venomous snakes willy nilly because we don't want to push it underground no absolutely not you know it should it should be re- it should be legis- it should be um, regulated and um I, I don't i don't think i i always feel the it will push it underground arguments quite 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 a weak one you know i understand with like substances it's a problem but you know no no one no one's really addicted to keeping snakes you know it's not like alcohol or or, or drugs you know i i think um I, I just think there's a proper way of doing it. And if a few people keep illegally, it's just it's just it's just not the end of the world. You know, there's there's plenty of people keeping illegally now. You know, there's, there's people keeping it keeping things illegally now. And that's not going to change if we if we, if you know if the government were to bring in a bring in a positive list. Yeah. My hmm. my, my my biggest my biggest concern would be um would be the the effect it would potentially have on the livelihoods of um you know of, of, of reptile shops. That that would be my bigger concern. They'd have to go harder on dry goods and um accept that there wouldn't be that diversity in um in, in the livestock. But I'll I'll be honest, the um the pet license reform laws that came in did far more damage to um to reptile shops than than a positive list you know ever would. Are you talking about the AAL? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. I knew that there was all that new legislation with sizes, what could be done. Um, yeah. is, is that it? Is it animals activities license? Yeah, that's that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. I think people have generally adapted. I mean, again, I, I keep going back to um, the one up in Grimsby, but where well when exceeds things like that i mean there's even something brewing now where the minimum is going to be something like for a snake it would be the length of snake by um two thirds of the snake in depth by one third of it in height which means for um like a royal that'd be like a four by if it's a four foot royal like a four by two and a half deep by like i just under two feet high and i'm yeah i'm like I think some shops can do it. Some sh- shops can't. And it's like, where do you draw the line of like sink or swim or should we just stay stagnant forever? I don't know. I, 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 I'm not getting involved with politics anymore. I'm just trying to help people look after animals, but I don't know the answer. I, 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 I don't, it's not my world. It's not my problem. But what I would say is pet shops are only ever transitional facilities it is not that animal's life. At least it shouldn't be. And I absolutely agree that there should be a minimum standard for the long-term housing and husbandry of these animals. But pet shops should just be temporary housing. And I think temporary housing can be done well and ethically under under the, the, the you know the 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 under, under the optimal of what that animal needs for long-term husbandry. So, but, but, you know, again, you know, my, my opinion on this is basically irrelevant. So we are at basically two hours now, but it looks of it. So I wanted you to give a question for the next guest. Did you have anything that you would have in mind for the next guest? Yeah. Um, following our, following our um, conversation around the positive list, um, I would like you to ask your next guest um, what their, feelings what's right what they feel the negatives of the enforcement of a positive list would be and how those negatives weigh against the the obvious positives and um yeah just have a bit of a discussion around the what their thoughts and feelings are around that brilliant it's a, it's, i've got a really good guest on for the next one um with a lot of experience and it is involved in zoos and education stuff so i think that might be a very oh, layered cool. answer so that is a brilliant question oh. for this guest um other than that thank you so much for coming on dave it's been a brilliant episode and i'm sure people are going to really enjoy this so thank, th- thank you so much good. for coming on 
My absolute pleasure, mate. I'm uh, I'm sorry I've been a little bit slow on the uptake and a bit dusty, but um, yeah, it's been my absolute pleasure to be here and uh, hopefully I'll give you a good episode. No, it's been a brilliant episode. Cheers. Thank you, mate.